Okay, it's recording. All right. Okay. Hi. Um, welcome to NBTI and happy National Day of Women and Girls in Science. We're so happy that you all are here. Uh, my name is Eleanor. And my name is Ray. Our presenter is Angela, a natural area preservation specialist, and she will be talking about the good of bugs. If there are any questions, please leave them in the chat. Angela, the floor is now yours. Yeah. So you see it's the display, correct? I just want to make sure you're seeing the full screen, not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. All right. So what good are bugs? Um, as a kid, you know, we always stomped on bugs. We hated stink bugs. My grandma's house was full of box elder bugs. Uh, so most people don't really appreciate bugs. Uh, I hope to change that. So just to give you a little bit of background on myself, uh, I work for the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission, which is a sister agency in the state of Illinois to the Department of Natural Resources. Um, I live and work uh, out of far Western Illinois, West Central Illinois. Uh, and I cover the, the area in yellow there. It's a fantastic job. I've been doing it for 27 years and I'm told it's, it's one of the best jobs there is. Certainly for me, um, I love my job and I have no intention of going anywhere. I'll be around for a little while longer. My job duties. So I do land protection. We basically have conservation easements where we protect high quality land. Um, we do management on that land. This, this site in particular had just been burned uh, and the flowers are popping up. And then plant and animal inventories, which is one of my favorite. I really love to go out and basically record all the plants um, and the animals that I find on the sites. Why did I choose this career path? Uh, just to kind of give you a background, um, I love being outdoors. Um, as a kid, I was an only child for 10 years. I grew up, I played outdoors a lot. And so the opportunity to get paid to run around outdoors and to actually protect it makes me feel really good. Um, I love to basically have that job satisfaction of being able to be on the most beautiful landscapes within the state and be able to protect those permanently into perpetuity. I love the knowledge that I'm doing something good for the environment. I am doing my part uh, to help. Why study bugs? Uh, well, one of the frustrating things is, as you know, we have manipulated our environment a lot. Uh, this picture on the right is a railroad corridor. Uh, on the bottom there is this beautiful plant that has actually stayed endangered. Uh, the railroad company comes through and sprays and sprays and sprays, and those are all weeds except for this little tiny sheltered area of endangered plants. That, from a botanist point of view, looking at the plant species there, is ugly. So that view, to me, based on what I know, uh, it's really distressing. But when I get my camera out with my low macro lens and I focus in on this insect, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. So basically I'm looking through a little soda straw and finding the beauty at a different scale. Um, that insect there still has what it needs to sustain itself. And that's important. And that's why I do what I do. I essentially have changed my perspective on what is beautiful by looking smaller. So in uh, 2018, so it's been six years now, I started a study. So I'm visiting six different sites a year. These are all protected nature preserves in Western Illinois. I pay, basically spend one hour each visit, uh, four times a year to get different seasons. And I attempt to photograph all of the insects visiting flowers and I record the flowers that they're visiting. I basically wanna find out Number one, what's on my sites. I want to under, have a good understanding of what's available to them, what flowers are available. And I want to know if the management that we're doing, the brush clearing, the prescribed fires, the invasive species control is benefiting the insects. Are the numbers going up when we manage? Or are they going down if we don't manage? Things like that. So I'm a big fan of iNaturalist. If you haven't used it, Oh my gosh, it is incredible. I would not be doing what I'm doing right now with all the insect work if it wasn't for iNaturalist. I love photography. I love to be able to go out with my camera, take pictures, upload it, and have some expert around the world somewhere tell me what it is. Uh, some of my bee photographs are being identified by an expert that now lives in Singapore. So that's really cool, this whole information sharing, the fact that they map it and you get to see all the representatives of that individual on the, in the whole globe. And that's really cool. The fact that we have that access and the networking through iNaturalist is just phenomenal and I love it. I highly encourage everybody 
to get the Seek app or to use iNaturalist. So I've got a lot of data. I've been out for six years now. I've basically collected information on 10,000 different insects, 900 species on 500 or 300 different flowers. So I have a lot of data and it gets to be overwhelming. I've got stacks and stacks and I try to pick little pieces and, and figure out what to do with it. Uh, but one of the things I've done is collaborate with the, the Field Museum in Chicago and I've created these rapid field guides. Uh, if you ever uh, wanted to Google this or get on there, I've created uh, these field guides on wasp, bees, flies, and then I did a whole series on moths. And essentially what I'm doing is taking my photographs, laying them out side by side into these photo sheets where I can then laminate them and take them out in the field. So these are free downloads. Uh, the laminator wasn't very expensive. Creating photocopies of color, that was expensive. So my whole series, all of these cost me about $50 to laminate, but you have you don't have to laminate them, but of course I wanna protect them from the weather. Uh, so this is kind of out of my frustration of not having field guides for Illinois, for the Midwest. I wanted to know what's found in my backyard and have something I could use. And then uh, in uh, 2021, a couple of years ago, uh, I got this opportunity to create a book. So I have made a book on flower bugs, which essentially is very similar, but there's a lot more text in it, uh, using my photographs on how to identify bugs. So I took true bugs, <clears throat> which I'll explain in a little bit. I wanted to basically bring awareness as the role that bugs play on flowers, because most people don't consider bugs, uh, like this assassin bug here, to be important in pollination or in flower visitations. I want to encourage others to go out, plant native, go out and monitor uh, the environment, go out and monitor, especially the prairies and the grasslands, which is where many of these are found. That's where your flowers are. And to protect and preserve native biodiversity. All right, so if you have any questions now um, about what I do or anything, or do you want me to keep going? All right, with that, I'll keep going. <laughs> Uh, true bugs. Uh, true bugs all have this beak-like mouth part with a sheath sword. So it's a very little stabby thing with four syringe blades for stabbing, spitting, and sucking. So that's the characteristic of the true bug uh, suborder, Heteroptera. This is a wheel bug, has a little cog-like on the back. Uh, this is the biggest bug there is in the Midwest. Uh, very formidable. Um, apparently it's very painful to get stabbed by this. I have not been stabbed and I have no intention of becoming stabbed. So I'm kind of careful about wheel bugs, but I really do love to photograph them. Uh, they are beautiful. True bug morphology, just kind of a little description. Uh, beetles have wing cover, of course true bugs fly, uh, but they have a different kind of pattern of their wing coverings. The wing covering consists of the, a lot of these hind wings, which are translucent, uh, soft, and just a little bit of hard coverings. Beetles, uh, most beetles have complete hard coverings in two pieces. There's a kind of like a triangle piece uh, here on the back, which is called the scutellum. So this is big triangle piece on the back with these partially soft, partially hard wings that fold across in the back. And then of course, there's your, your long piercy mouth part. The life cycle bugs, of course, true bugs uh, have nymph stages. So they don't have the whole cocoon and chrysalis and the grub that uh, beetles and butterflies go through. They essentially, the babies, once they hatch, they are little nymphs, which basically are similar to what the adults gonna look like without wings. So they go through five different instar nymph stages until they become an adult and can fly and breathe. Uh, so this is just a little picture of these uh, squash bugs uh, just leaving their eggs. Uh, so a lot of times you'll find bugs and their eggs on the undersurfaces of leaves. Bug identification. Bug basically bugs get confused a lot for beetles. And I get really frustrated because like I explained with the wings, it's, it's kind of easy uh, when you know what you're looking at to tell whether it's a bug. Usually the wings, uh, coatings, basically coverings are softer in uh, bugs, but there's some other things to see. So bugs versus beetles. So the juniper stink bug, as you can see on the left there, has those translucent, you can see through wing tips on the back and has that triangular scutellum uh, right over the center of the back. So the beetle has again, the two hard coverings that completely cover the abdomen and cover the wings. The wings have to unfold 
and unfurl underneath those hard coverings. Um, these are uh, the little ebony bugs, or it looks like little seeds, and the pill scarab beetle also looks like a seed. But one of the differences, there's a little size difference, but again, even though the ebony bug doesn't seem to have very triangle, basically that triangle scutellum covers the whole abdomen uh, in this case. Uh, but the beetle has the two parts that are gonna break away for the wings to come out. So there's two wing coverings on that one. These are the common milkweed bugs, which everybody's familiar with. Again, um, they just have those two, these are the wing coverings with the soft translucent um, hind wings. Beetles have the two uh, hard coverings over their back. Just a couple more cactus corades and soldier beetles. There's some kind of orange and black ones. Uh, there's so many different color variations. I actually, I just, I'm so fascinated by insects, but those hard coverings on the beetle are called elytra. Uh, antenna segments are, can also be different in bugs. A lot of times there's four segments where beetles have a lot more segments on their antennae. And so I thought I'd go over just a few of the common bugs that people tend to misidentify. So here's four brown stink bugs that until I really started this project, I had a hard time telling them apart. I thought, well, maybe it's the shoulder spikes. They can all have shoulder spikes. So that's not the key feature. So this one on the left is predatory. So if you find a brown stink bug basically feeding on a caterpillar, it's gonna be this one. Um, they do have this dark spot on those clear hind wings. And if that is present, sometimes it gets worn off, then you know it's the spine soldier bug. Uh, these are the brown marmorated stink bugs. These are the ones that are coming into our house right now. Uh, they are invasive. They are not from here. I think they're from Asia. They have been brought over. They like our house. They'll breed all year round inside our house um, and they've become a crop pest. Uh, so those are identified by these light patches on the antenna. There's usually two white pat pale patches on the antenna that are not found in other brown stink bugs. And then on the far right is our native common brown stink bug. Um, that's a little bit harder to uh, distinguish. There is this dark blotch in the center of that triangular scutellum that's often present. Um, those are identified usually by their belly color and the uh, basically rings around the spiracles on their bellies. So here's some of the milkweed seed bugs. Uh, these are commonly found on milkweeds and other flowers. Uh, they're very brightly colored patterned, you know, red and black, orange and black. Uh, so the small milkweed bug is characterized by having a single black heart over its thorax. So on top of the back has one heart. And then a lot of times the tips of the wings are just outlined in a real faint white. And this is the false milkweed bug. And in this one, the hearts are stacked. So there's two smaller hearts over top of the back. So in the scutellum and the thorax, two hearts. The large milkweed bug is a little bit bigger, sometimes a little bit more orange in coloration, but it has this large black band that goes across the center. And there's the little tiny black bugs again. The white margin burrow bug has a white that goes all the way around from the tip of the head, all the way around the body to the other side of the head. Um, it's definitely bold white coloration. The ebony bug can have a white kind of a translucent uh, ring around it, but it doesn't go across the uh, thorax. So it doesn't come close to the eye. It's only around the, usually the sides and maybe a little bit of the back. Green stink bugs. Uh, the one on the left is really common. In fact, we'll start seeing those as things warm up. It's gonna be in the 60s today. So if I go around the woods today, kicked a few leaves around, there's a good chance I would see some uh, green stink bugs. Uh, this species, uh, in addition to being really common, uh, can be characterized by along the sides there, it's kind of yellow with these little black uh, colorations between each of the different abdominal segments. Um, the pink bordered green stink bug usually has a bright, pink border all the way around it. Uh, in this case, it's just kind of a pale greenish yellow. Um, I thought I'd show a picture that's one that's has a little bit different coloration. The red shoulder stink bug, as the name indicates, usually has a red shoulder. So there's usually kind of a dark reddish um, stripe from one shoulder tip to the other shoulder tip across the back. Um, this one doesn't have it. Sometimes they also come in brown colors, but they tend to have these really pale speckles um, across those wing coverings. Where to find bugs? So that's a lot of what my book is about. I want people to go out there 
in their prairies, in their backyards, in the woods, in the nature preserves, and go look for bugs and learn how to find them because it's a process of learning. I can't believe how much more I see now that I have trained myself and I spend hours and hours and hours doing this. Uh, so but some bugs, as I mentioned, are household pets. So the box elder bug and the brown marmorated stink bugs are two that tend to like to go into uh, protective shelter areas, including human houses. Uh, garden pests, um, I don't see these as pests because I'm not necessarily raising a garden. My prairie is planted for the bugs, and so I want to attract them. So I'm more concerned about whether it belongs there. Is it native or not? All three of these bugs are native, so I have no problem with them in my backyard. But people who are trying to raise a garden or people trying to uh, raise crops uh, occasionally uh, have some concerns about this. And fortunately, some are getting some appreciation for their use as biocontrols. So a lot of the bugs are predatory um, and will feed on other insects that might be harming the plant. Um, so they're being used, in some cases, this minute pirate bug, you can actually buy them. You can go on to um, Amazon and buy a little container of minute pirate bugs, probably thousands of them, and release in your garden to control thrips. Uh, and so some of these actually are available for commercial sale. So the relationship between true bugs and native plants. A lot of people I work with are very interested in this. They want to know if I plant, you know, what plants should I put in my backyard so I can attract uh, the most pollinators. So bugs play an important role. It's not really understood everything that they do, um, but they really have an impact on the way a plant grows because they're basically punching into it, sucking out the juices. Um, they're really kind of manipulating their environment and we really don't quite understand. Uh, in this case, the damsel bug is actually laying her eggs into the stem of a goldenrod. So many bugs feed on pollen and nectar. And that's something that I didn't learn uh, on my own. I didn't learn that in, in college. Uh, nobody told me that bugs actually feed on pollen and nectar, but I started taking photographs and it became very obvious what they were doing. Um, so this bug on the left is an assassin bug. Assassin bugs, because as their name would suggest, kill other bugs. That is what they do. Their primary food source is going to be by killing other bugs. This one has clearly got his whole face uh, stuck inside a flower and is sipping nectar. Now, is it doing it just for an extra little sugar high? Um, is food sources low? I doubt it because my prairie is full of bugs. So I doubt that he's short on a supply of other insects to eat. So I don't know why. Maybe supplementing diet, maybe there's something in that nectar he needs. Usually uh, nectar is just like us drinking soda pop. It just gives you a nice little, little rush. It doesn't have a lot of nutrients. It's pollen that has the protein and nutrients that a lot of insects need. Uh, so some of these are clearly feeding on pollen. Uh, this ebony bug in the top is just coated with pollen. Uh, plant bug down the bottom definitely is a pollen feeder. Uh, seed bugs. There's a lot of bugs that actually uh, lay their eggs and the little nymphs will hatch on the flower heads or seed heads. Um, so it's kind of frustrating when I go out and collect uh, prairie seed in the fall because I don't want to take bugs off of my prairie. I just want seed and I'll be collecting this stuff and they'll just be, now that I know how to look for bugs, I find bugs everywhere. And so I'll try to skip, well, I'm not going to take that flower hat. I'll take this one. Um, but there's so many bugs out there. I look in my bowl of seed that I've collected and it can just be teeming with bugs. And so I try to find a way to put them back in the prairie. Otherwise, they're probably either going to die in storage or I'm going to move them to another site, which may not be a bad thing, depending on how far they're going. Uh, we may actually want, in some cases, to move the bugs around to another location uh, just to kind of help the diversity of that site. Some predatory bugs are opportunistic feeders. Um, so they're feeding on pests of the different flowers. Mm -hmm. Japanese beetles you may have heard about are a huge pest that we very much dislike for what it does to grapes and some of the uh, other prairie plants can just devastate roses. Um, there's a sassin bug feeding on one. Uh, the small milkweed bug is feeding on a dead honeybee. Essentially the honeybee uh, came up to a common milkweed plant and it has these pollen packs that get stuck on its feet and it gets stuck and it basically can't get away and it dies. This happens a lot with, uh, with uh, milkweeds. That's just kind of the way they're designed. And so this milkweed bug is deciding to try uh, something else for diet. So instead of sucking on plant juices, he's sucking on the juices of the honeybee. Uh, so plant associations. So these are just a list of some of the flowers uh, that I try to encourage people uh, to plant or look at. In one case, 
I think I have common ragweed in there. I don't suggest anybody go out and plant common ragweed, but if you have it out there, it is native and there are some bugs that go to that. So this next series is just a bunch of photographs um, that kind of tell about which bugs will visit which plants because some are very host specific. Some insects are really only, some of the bugs are only found on one species and that's it. You won't find them elsewhere. So milkweeds, of course, are very important. They're not just for monarchs. Um, there's a lot of it, uh, bugs out there that really prefer milkweeds, all different species of milkweeds. Uh, so this one in the bottom is called a wild four o'clock bug. It uh, came from the West along the railroad stuff. It basically got transported here to the Midwest. Um, it's supposed to feed on wild four o'clock. Um, a lot of my areas don't have that species. So it has adapted to feed on milkweeds. Then of course, there are several milkweed bugs that I've mentioned. Mountain mints is one of my absolute favorite. As one thing, it says, has a beautiful mint smell to it. It doesn't get very tall. It's not a very aggressive plant, but the, all the pollinators, not just bugs, absolutely love this. In fact, this year I went out December 23rd, um, just kind of checking out my prairie. And of course the seed heads are all dried up, uh, but I found uh, both species on, in the center and the left still hanging out um, on these. Basically, they're going to overwinter in the seed heads. So this is a kind of an unusual, this is a leaf-footed bug. Um, the adult doesn't look quite this way. Uh, this one's flattened. It's dorsal then it's flattened. So it's really kind of a funny looking thing. It has a really brilliant green. When it grows up uh, to be an adult, um, it will be all brown. It won't have that beautiful green color, but that green really blends into the foliage and allows it to go unseen by predators. Uh, another legume or pea plant, the bush, uh, bush clovers. Um, these broad-headed bugs that have a bigger head compared to the size of their body. Absolutely love all these different pea flowers. This is a new one I just discovered. Essentially, I have a lot of white wild indigo in my backyard. And I saw this little dusty mildew stuff on the underside of the leaves. And my eyesight's getting worse. I could, these are really, really tiny. So I couldn't tell what it was. So I got on my camera. I took a few shots with my macro lens, brought to the computer, blew them up. It's like, oh my gosh, these are lace bugs. Um, so that's what I really want people to go out and do because very few people have posted uh, this species on iNaturalist and I want more people to go out there and look for them and turn over the leaves and start. If you see specks on them, take a picture. It may be a speck. It may be, you know, scat. It may be just a waste product, but sometimes it's, it's an insect uh, and it's important to know those little tiny ones. Uh, partridge pea is a pretty little yellow flower that does not produce any nectar. So this plant bug that's feeding on it is actually feeding on pollen. Uh, we know that because that's the only thing that they can get. Um, so just to let you know, I have three acres in my backyard and I have photographed um, and identified 2000 different invertebrates, mostly insects and spiders uh, within that small space. Um, so I'm really big about packing as many flowers and bringing them into my yard if I can. A lot of these photographs are taken from my backyard, which is it's kind of a therapy at the end of my work day just to go out or if I have a short little lunch break uh, to go out in the yard and just uh, look at or photograph uh, insect there. Uh, Scrupular ACA is a type of tube flower. There's also mints uh, that have these little pink tube flowers that the twice stabbed stink bugs sit in. Uh, and so they basically love these little flowers and they just hang out there. So whenever you find these types of flowers, uh, you just kind of look inside and a lot of times these bugs will be in there. This is one of my favorites. Um, I originally, when I learned about this stink bug, it said it was found on Queen Anne's lace, wild carrot, uh, which is a weed that's non-native. Um, and I wasn't really interested in that. But in my yard, I found them only on Rattlesnake Master, and they love Rattlesnake Master. They are on these seed heads, flower heads, from July through October until it gets cold. They're probably still on there. They're probably just burrow into the seed heads to spend the winter. Uh, but fascinating little bugs, and they just cling to that flower. And it's so easy. I just think it's so nice to know what flower to go look for, and bam, I find the bug. Uh, that close association. They do not want to be found anywhere else but on this flower. So you need that flower. Goldenrods, of course, are very, very numerous across the landscape. 
and there's a lot of assassin bugs that really like goldenrods. This one on the right uh, actually does feed on the nectar. Uh, the one on the left likes to use a goldenrod for obvious reasons. He blends in really well with his coloration. And so the other insects coming to feed on goldenrod don't see the predator. Uh, they start feeding on the flower and they get snatched up and eaten. Asters, uh, asters are really numerous. There's more species of asters than any other uh, plant out there. Uh, a lot of times they're weedy and they just pop up, but they provide wonderful uh, food sources uh, for bugs. Daisy fleabane is just this little tiny plant. They're beautiful little daisy-like flowers, but nobody usually plants them. They just kind of pop up as weeds. But in all of my studies, I have found out that this is the most important, the favorite flower for true bugs. This is the one, this benign little plant uh, has so many different bugs that come to visit it. Uh, this scentless plant bug on the left is kind of a pinky screen in color, just beautiful. They love, love daisy flea banes. This tarnished plant bug on the right is another common one. It's probably the most common bug that I find on flowers out there in the landscape. This one will do damage, cosmetic damage to some of your garden and ornamental plants. But like I said, I don't plant these things for beauty. I plant flowers in my prairie for functionality. I want them to serve the bugs and to attract more bugs. So if I have chewed up leaves, pockmarked leaves, that's great. That means that plant is serving its purpose. Prickly pear cactus. So this species only gets up to the cactus corade, only gets up to central Illinois and some of the sand areas that we have. We haven't found them further north yet. Um, but it lives its whole life. The little babies and the adults live the whole life on cactus. So if you don't have cactus, you definitely won't have this bug. Um, I've seen it in Missouri. Uh, they're probably doing a lot better there because there's probably more cactus the further south you go. Um, there are cactus corides, uh, certainly in, in Southwest. Uh, we are just the Northern tip of this species, but a very beautiful species and certainly does seem to like the flowers and the cactus pads. Milkworts. So this is a funky looking um, leaf-footed bug is what they're called. Now, some of the leaf-footed bugs have appendages on their, on their back legs and that's why they're called leaf-footed bugs. Uh, but the nymphs like these little milkworts. Uh, this is the only photograph I found. The nymphs aren't very visible usually, they kind of hide. Uh, but the adults seem to be covered in this velvety pubescence, kind of bumpy backs and stuff. They're just really interesting to look at. And they're oftentimes found on goldenrod. Oxeye false sunflower is the uh, host plant for the false milkweed bug. This again is the one with the two hearts stacked back to back. If you don't have that plant, you won't have this, even though this is a really common bug. Uh, it does have to have its host plant because it's babies at least rely on that plant. Biennial gara. This is a plant that actually grows really tall, but it's kind of wispy little flowers and most people don't notice it. But when it's flowering, it's almost always covered with these stilt bugs. They love it. They absolutely, they just breed, they lay eggs, they lay their babies all over it. And they just, they're found there from the time of flowering, probably August, September, October. Uh, they are out there until freeze. Common ragweed, as I mentioned, is not one that anybody should plant. It is native. Um, and there are some bugs that certainly do like to uh, feed on common ragweed. That little ornate plant bug is just so pretty, but it's really, really tiny. Uh, some of these bugs are only a few millimeters, so like three dimes stacked together. That would be the size of that bug, height wise. Ohio spiderwort, uh, for whatever reason, this beautiful plant bug I find in the clusters of spiderwort. They tend to like to go, I don't know what it's doing. I don't know exactly if it's foraging on the flowers. Uh, this one doesn't produce um, any nectar, so it's only pollen. So I don't know for sure if they're feeding on the pollen or there's the juices, but it likes the flower clusters. Orange jewelweed uh, is another one. Touch me not, uh, impatience um, are the names of this plant. Um, the adults don't really go to it, but the babies, they look like the young nymphs there look like their coloration was just tailor-made and adapted for this flower. They blend in so well with that combination of orange and black and green. Uh, they just seem to fit in really well with that flower. Elderberry is a little shrub. Um, it's the only plant that this bug is found on, the elderberry plant bug. So you have to have elderberry to find that one. 
And that essentially uh, is the end of my slideshow. I just wanted to show this cute little picture of two uh, nymph wheel bugs uh, and just kind of encourage you to get out there. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I can talk about bugs or I can talk about other types of pollinators or insects. I'm really into just a little bit of everything. And I'm just happy uh, to be here and to have this opportunity. Yeah, we have a few questions. Is it? Oh, okay. All right, okay. let's go. So the first one is asking about the photos that you have on your slides and um, if you took any coursework on photography as a part of your scientific training. My husband is a very good photographer and he's tried to teach me, but he's my husband. And I don't listen very well. Uh, so a lot of this is trial and error. So I, yeah, um, he always likes to tell people that I come running to him with my camera and say, fix it. Um, so <laughs> he, he is my teacher. I'm a really poor student. Uh, but yeah, a lot of it's trial and error. And having a good camera. OK, the next question is, um... Last year, I saw a lot of staghorn beetles in my garden and more than they've ever seen before. And was last year a good year for them? Do you know that? I did not see any. I mean, I may have seen one. I've seen very few staghorns. So that's really, really, really cool. Uh, anytime you see something like that, I just think uh, staghorns and some species aren't doing as well. Um, so that I would say is quite a fun. Um, there's a few more. There's another question asking, um, the person is asking, I have seen a lot of people building insect hotels. Do these really help insects or are they more of a fad? Uh, they may insect, uh, I would say more of a fad, my own personal opinion. They may help insects, but sometimes not in the way you would think. Um, so people put up bee hotels and unless you clean those hotels up or buy some that are like replaceable, some people will like, get some straws or some, uh, you know, empty tube like, uh, and just kind of tie them together and replace them every year. And that would be good. Um, but if you have a permanent structure that the bees are going, like mason bees are going into, the wasps find that. So the predators see these hotels and think, ah, banquet. Um, so it is a feeding for predators. So yeah, you're benefiting the predators, but that's probably not you what you want to be doing. So if you don't clean those hotels um, and houses, you know, you may have issues like that. There's diseases that can get in. Anytime you have concentrations, if they're not cleaned, uh, same thing, you know, with bird feeders and bird houses, you know, they need to be cleaned and maintained. Um, if there's something, you know, you really want to do to bring in, you know, insects close to view, that's what it's for. It's not helping the insect. What helps the insect is habitat, habitat, habitat. So providing, you know, areas that are sheltered, providing little nesting sites. Uh, we do a lot of burning, which helps the flowers, but you have to leave areas unburned. You have to leave, um, don't clean up your yard. Don't clean up all the sticks and stuff uh, every year. A lot of times people wait until May. Um, or just leave some things, just leave it messy. Um, it's a good excuse for those of us who don't lot of, like to do a lot of uh, yard cleanup. Uh, say, hey, we're doing it for the insects. <laughs> but I am doing it for the insects. Okay. Um, the next question is, we got a newsletter from our city that recommends we leave all of our garden alone until May to help the insects. And as you said just now, um, can you tell me why it's important to leave plant stuff and leaves? It feels weird to leave it. It looks messy. Right. Right. Well, the, some of them, are, like I showed, are overwintering. They're overwintering in those flower heads. They're overwintering in the stems. They're overwintering underneath the leaves. I mean, how many people have seen the uh, woolly bear caterpillars? They basically just go underneath the leaves or something, and they allow their bodies to freeze solid. I mean, this was a really cold winter about four weeks ago, um, and they can survive that. Um, they basically have this ability um, for their um, cells to freeze without bursting uh, them open. And that's kind of amazing. Um, so yes, leaving things um, just so we have, you know, we don't need to clean everything. Um, so if there's a way to, sometimes what I do if I need to cut it is I'll cut it and I'll stack it in the side of my yard. Um, so it's there. So if the insects are still in there, I haven't burned it. I haven't bagged it up in a trash bag and hauled it off to the dump. 
um, I want them to stay in my yard. So I'll just put it over in another part of my yard so they can escape and do their thing. Okay, um, the next question. Besides their appearances, is there any major differences between milkweed bugs regarding what they eat? All milkweed bugs, well, false milkweed bug will actually feed on milkweeds too. But the two true milkweed bugs like to feed on the seeds of milkweeds. They never, for some reason, you know, everybody's really protective of milkweeds because of the monarch. Um, but we never see um, any serious damage to the seeds. So whatever they're feeding on and nibbling, um, they're not doing uh, serious damage to milkweed seed production. But they do feed on a lot of different similar uh, species, but they do have to have milkweeds to produce their young. Uh, so that's the big tie. Uh, that's why they're there. That's why they're on the plants is because the milkweed seeds and the pods themselves provide something necessary for the production of their young. Okay, um, and the next question is, what do we do if we find a bug that is not native? Um, up to you. I don't kill them all. Uh, we can't kill them all. Um, I really have a thing for Chinese mantids because they kill a lot of butterflies. So while I don't actively go around my yard seeking to kill Chinese mantids, when I'm out collecting seed with scissors, uh, I occasionally find the pregnant females and, you know, the scissors kind of slip and, you know, I do the same thing that she's going to do to the male and I clip the head off. Um, that's a, I don't, like I said, I don't do that all of them, but I get really frustrated because they produce thousands of babies and those babies just, I mean, they grow up to be adults. They have really high success and they just shred butterflies. There'll be butterfly wings all over the place. And so that bothers me that I see so many. Um, some things are out of sight, out of mind. Obviously the brown marmorated stink bugs come into your house. I suggest, that, you know, if they're in your house, get rid of them. Uh, you don't want them, but I really hate the use of pesticides and insecticides, uh, because that's not gonna, just gonna harm your host, that's gonna harm other things. Uh, so I'm very opposed to using that. But if you wanna squish them, make sure you know what it is, because the native brown stink bug is very closely related to the brown marmorated stink bug. And if you don't see that antennae difference, see that white patches in the non-native and you kill a native one, yeah, there's still a lot out there, but yeah, don't do it. Okay, you also mentioned that some bugs are being sold commercially to gardeners to help them get rid of certain pests. Does this cause a problem for the environment if there's suddenly a large population of insects being introduced? That one is really small. That's kind of interesting. Those minute pirate bugs, those little black ones, um, are, are basically introduced because there's a lot of thrips. So there's a lot of food out there and the food that they're feeding on is non-native as well. And it's a garden pest. And because they're so small, I have not seen a problem with those. Not like the Chinese mantis, which you can buy Chinese mantis as well. People buy Chinese mantis uh, to go after things. People bought the uh, Asian multicolored lady beetle to go after aphids. And now we're overrun with uh, Asian lady beetles and they'll come into the house too. Um, so there's instances like those two, the Chinese mantis and the Asian lady beetle that certainly are becoming too abundant. And sometimes you never know. I may be speaking this now and saying that minute pirate bugs are not a problem. And 10, 20 years from now, they could be a problem. So I'm not big on introducing things. Uh, the minute pirate bug is non-native. Although you look at iNaturalist and there are more sightings of it in the United States than anywhere else in the world. So I kind of question uh, whether or not it truly is. Why are they not seeing it in Europe if it came from Europe? Um, it sounds like, yeah, maybe. maybe. Maybe they're having trouble in Europe and their populations are crashing and they're succeeding in North America. I don't know. But that's kind of a strange question to me as to why they're doing so well. Um, but like I said, they're really small and they, they don't do anything but kill thrips, uh, which nobody likes anyway. Um, feed on a little bit of pollen. So. Okay. Um, the next question is, is there any legislation that protects bees and other pollinators and is it legal to directly spray bees and other pollinators? Well, most of the protection for bees relates to the domesticated honeybees. So all the managed hives, that's where the protection lies um, because it's all based on the farm industry. Essentially, the honeybee is domesticated for farm crops. Um, it's not a better pollinator for a lot of our natives for like blueberries and apples and things like that. 
um, the native pollinators do far better. But because honeybees are easy to find, uh, because they're going back to their you know managed hives or occasionally feral hives where they get into a tree, we know how to find them and we know how to see the impact. So if the bees start dying, they all die below the hive. Uh, when a solitary bee dies, nobody knows about it because uh, they're all solitary, they're all scattered around, nobody knows about the impact. So it's really hard to prove that neonicotinoids are having the impact. We know they're having an impact on all the bees, but all the research for the most part is being done on honeybees and a little bit on bumblebees. So we don't have a lot of good regulation here in the United States yet on neonicotinoids, um, which are the ones that are really impacting the bees. There's other chemicals as well, certainly are impacting insects, uh, but we just don't know enough. In Europe, they've banned neonics. You cannot buy neonicotinoid pesticides. All of our corn right now, and I think 80% of our soybeans are all seed treated with neonicotinoids. And that's really scary. Uh, for the insects, because if they eat those in the plants or they chew or nibble on that plant, it could be lethal. They could die. And we don't know they're dying because they're just uh, by themselves falling off in the field. So no regulation really, unless it's endangered or threatened. And very few are endangered and threatened that have that protective status. Uh, but the rusty patch bumblebee was our first bee that became federally listed. And so there is some... Um, the Federal Endangered Species Act does protect the rusty patch bumblebee. Okay, so we have a question from Stephanie. Uh, how many days on average does a bumblebee live for? So uh, it kind of depends because the queens right now, all the males have died. Right now the queens are in the ground. So they have basically, they hatched probably in uh, October, uh, September. Um, they did their thing. They basically got mated with a male and they basically kind of got into a hole, provisioned a little bit and basically gone into hibernation. They will come out this spring. A lot of them will come out in April and May and then they will produce the next generation, the whole generation. So they will produce one generation and then their babies will produce another generation. Uh, but it's only the female. She's living from October through maybe June. Um, most of the other ones that are going to hatch her Gen next generation that she produces may only live about a month. Um, so a lot of bugs, there are exceptions. You know, we got the cicadas that are hatching this year. They got 13 and 17 year cicadas. So obviously cicadas have one of the longest lifespans of any. Of course, monarchs producing about, what is it? Three or four different generations in a year. The ones that travel south live the longest. Um, so it's kind of interesting how insects have you know, a certain generation that lives, you know, what, six months, and some generations live one month. Some of them live two weeks. Uh, there's a few of them out there. I know there's uh, moths that when they um, actually come out of their chrysalis, they have no mouth. Uh, the big silk moths, like the luna moths, you cannot feed a luna moth in its moth stage. You can feed it as a caterpillar, but once it um, becomes a, a moth with wings and whatnot flying around, it has to mate, and then it's going to die. It's got a couple days, and that's it. It's dead. So it lives its longer life, of course, as a caterpillar, uh, very little life as an adult. Um, the next question is, you have to know so much about plants. How did you learn all of this about plants? And can you recommend some books for a person just starting out? Um, I started with a book called Newcombs Flower Guide. Um, what I love about Newcombs is it has four questions. This is this is what I learned. Well, I, I taught myself plants. So I mean, I, I taught, took very few classes in college to learn plants. But new comes, you ask four questions. I think one is the position of the leaves. Are they opposite or are they alternate? Or are they whorled? Um, the, the number of flower petals, so the different rays. Is there four petals or are there five petals? Is it a vine or you know a freestanding plant? Um, I can't remember what the third question is, but you answer those four simple questions and then it has a key and it will show you the plants that it could possibly be. And then you look at the pictures. So a lot of us, even as we become more advanced, we have way too many books. Uh, can you have too many books? <laughs> but we look at the pictures. I mean, even the guys who have wrote, wrote the best uh, dichotomous keys for a lot of the plant species, look to look at pictures and illustrations uh, to match the features. And so they actually bring their illustrated guides out or they'll bring the plants back into the office most likely. And then they'll hold it up to the different books and learn that way. 
Um, so, but I didn't, when I was learning, I didn't have iNaturalist. Like I said, I use iNaturalist mostly for insects, but you can use iNaturalist for plants as well. Going out and taking a picture. In the case of a plant, you would take a picture of the whole plant and then you would want to focus in on the flowers, the seeds, the leaves, the different structures of that plant. Post it on iNaturalist and you will learn so much. There's people out there that can help you. Um, there's, you can get into discussions. You can basically tag people that are the experts and ask them, why is it this? And hopefully they'll tell you when they identify it for you, it's this because of, you know, it has this feature and that's why I identified it as that. So it's such an important tool now. I mean, I still love books. I'm old school. I like to have a book that I can hold, but there's so many resources out there online. There's a lot of apps that of course you can like hold your phone up, take a picture and the app will go through AI and tell you what it thinks it is. Now it may be wrong. So you don't want to necessarily trust that. Um, but what amazing things. I mean, the ability of this artificial intelligence to help us basically have a computer go process all that information and give us, you know, indication of what it thinks it is. It's amazing. And how that's going to improve. I mean, we have no idea how it's going to improve, but what an exciting time uh, to be a naturalist. And to me, the key right now, there's not enough of us being paid to do this kind of work. We need people out there with cameras. And I don't care if it's your phone take pictures and learn that way. This is amazing. Okay, so we have another question from Stephanie. What is the most rare bug you've ever seen? Okay, so uh, right now I'm on the Endangered Species uh, Technical Advisory Committee for Terrestrial Invertebrates for Insects. And so I'm out there looking. Um, it's always funny, um, some of the people I talk to say, how can you always find the weird bugs, the rare ones? It's like, cause that's what I'm looking for. Um, so there's uh, one bee in particular that I'm just going to think of. I found out the Garden of the Gods in the Shawnee National Forest in Southern Illinois. I've only seen it once. Uh, nobody else has seen one uh, in the Midwest. I think there's a couple uh, in the United States. So my photograph that I posted on Bug Guide and iNaturalist has been used again and again um, because it's one of the few. It's called uh, uh, Molecta Pacifica Atlantica. It's its scientific name. It's a morning Bug. Basically, it looks kind of like a bumblebee, but it has a tapered abdomen. Uh, it's a really funny looking. It has a little short face. It's just fuzzy and cute. Uh, I had no idea what it was, but it's a it's a host parasite on another bee that feeds on blueberries. So it basically captures the nest of another bee, it lays its eggs, and then leaves, uh, kills those bees, and then leaves. And, and that their young offspring will use the resources of that host bee <laughs> after it's been killed. Uh, and their young can feed on that. Uh, so it's really interesting dynamic on that one. But that's probably the rarest one I've seen is this morning bee uh, down in Southern Illinois. Okay, related to that question, um, what is your favorite type of bug? Oh gosh, there's no type, there's no favorites. <laughs> I have certain favorites, but it's a long list. I mean, these wheel bugs, let's face it, they, those, those are pretty cool. Uh, a lot of the brightly colored ones. I just, I get so excited uh, when I find things. Uh, my goal obviously is to find the rare stuff. Uh, so sometimes the more rare it is, I get so excited. because Oh my gosh, I found it, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, there's always that drive. We always joke about, you know, being able to name a new species new to science. Um, I don't know that I'll ever get there, uh, but there's a chance with insects um, because there's just so many out there that have yet uh, to be scientifically described. And so I guess, yeah, I have certain favorites, um, but I can't, I can never pin it down to, you know, just a few. <laughs> okay, um, have you ever studied mosquitoes? And if you have, how do they survive during winter? Uh, I like the males. I don't like the females. Because uh, the males actually are pollinators and they don't have anything that stabs and sucks blood. So I, I have a thing for males, but the girls I don't like so much. Um, I have a really hard time uh, photographing um, something that's feeding on me. Um, I have friends that actually can stand there their, and let the mosquitoes feed on them while they're clicking their pictures. I will tell them to hold still while I take pictures of them on their hand, but I, I smack it. <laughs> I'm bad about that. Same thing with ticks. Uh, if a tick is in the natural environment, I can take pictures of it. If it's on me, it's dead. Uh, I just, I have that thing. I, I can't get over that yet. <laughs> Um, so where do mosquitoes go? A lot of insects will overwinter as, you know, eggs or larvae. 
uh, somewhere and you know an old pie or something. I don't know. It might be that the males are, are or females are hiding underneath the bark, uh, things like that. They go into secluded place. Somehow, obviously, mosquitoes are able to survive. But there are some beautiful, beautiful ones out there. And I have photographed a lot of females night lighting on the sheet at night uh, when they're busy uh, staying on that sheet. Um, but yeah, when they're on me, I don't like them. <laughs> Um, the next question is, do you know how or why cicadas stay dormant for so long? What an amazing life cycle, isn't it? I'm so excited about this year. I'm going to try to get to see both of them if I can. Uh, a couple of years ago, I did get to see a brood X, which was in far east central Illinois. So cicadas have developed this uh, life cycle, which it's advantageous for them to emerge in mass in the millions because you overwhelm the predators. So that's the strategy that they have developed. Um, so predators can eat a lot of them, and they do eat a lot of them, but they can't basically mobilize to eat all of them. They cannot, predators cannot mobilize around the areas fast enough to make a dent in the population. So that's how they were able to survive and reboot. But the, the fact that they can stay in the ground that long is just absolutely incredible. And they are the loudest insects. Uh, by size of any of, of any animal, they are the loudest, and so it's going to be noisy. But some of us are really excited about this story. <laughs> okay, next we have a question from in the environmental science class at Elgin. Are there any insects with venomous defense mechanisms? I'm trying to think. Well, a lot of I don't know about insects. Of course, spiders all have venom, whether or not they're you know. Toxic, you know, you have your black widows, you have your um, insects, though. I'm not aware of any. I just know that they hurt. The wheel bug apparently is extremely painful and it'll hurt for like weeks. Uh, so you don't want to get um, hung by that. But it's a lot of them are not injecting venom. That's a spider thing and a snake thing. Um, so I'm not aware of any insect. There may be, I'm sure, because um, I don't know all the ones around the world. I mean, there's obviously scorpions and things like that that, that do that, but I'm not aware that any insect actually has venom that paralyzes. Like I said that's something that spiders do. Um, from the Facebook Elgin High School Environmental Science class, um, we have, since we've had a strange warm up this year, will that cause any insects to come out earlier than normal? Oh, definitely. Uh, in fact, I've got friends already photographing things. I don't know if I'll be able to get out. I didn't get out yesterday, uh, but today's going to be a warm day. Uh, like I said, I was seeing those insects December 23rd, uh, which you normally wouldn't see insects out on December 23rd. Uh, and as cold as it's been, but yeah, as soon as it gets about mm -hmm. 60 and if it gets sunny, they will come out because there's a lot of adults that are just kind of hiding underneath shelter. They're hiding underneath loose bark and tree. That bark warms up and they're out. Um, they're looking to breed. Those stink bugs, I am sure, are out in the woods today. Um, so just to, like I said, 60 degrees is the big thing. A lot of times it takes a while for them to kind of get going and, and warm up. But once that sun hits them, yep, they'll come out and they'll get cold again. They'll go back under and pop back out. And the biggest thing I'm concerned about with this weird climate that we're having um, is the, the flowering, the timing of the flowering and the timing of the emergence, is it going to happen together? So a lot of times insects are emerging before their favorite plant is flowering. And that's a real problem because that plant needs that insect, that insect needs that flower and making those connections is a problem. Some insects are able to adapt to other flowers. Some flowers have plenty of different types of pollinators. So they don't need that one host uh, insect. Um, but those relationships are being stretched uh, and strained. And so that's a little bit of a concern. Uh, some things are able to, as climate change happens, some species are able to move northward. We've seen that in bugs. There's a red-shouldered bug that I showed a picture of on mountain mint that has just shown up here. Last year it was in St. Louis. Um, I'm finding it 200 miles north of that this year. And I found it in several locations. That one is obviously moving north. Uh, some are not. Bumblebees is one that's they're not moving north. Their populations are doing better up north, but they are not shifting their populations north with a changing climate. So bumblebees are a lot more vulnerable. Um, okay, the next question: Is there a non-native that we should be especially that should be especially an issue right now? A few years ago, we had to worry about the emerald ash 
which is a beetle. Um, so, I, of course, the lanternfly is the one that everybody's worried about. That's the next one that people are worried about. Gypsy moth, or sorry, spongy moth now. Uh, spongy moth is another concern because it kills oak trees. Um, my personal opinion um, is that we overreact sometimes. Uh, Department of Agriculture likes to use, well, they try to use mating disruptor on the uh, spongy moths and basically cause the males to breed with, you know, pheromone versus their own females. Uh, and therefore the females don't get impregnated and produce young. Uh, I have no problem with that, but using mass insecticides, I really, you know, even part of agriculture will admit it's gonna kill all lepidoptera. It's gonna kill all moths and butterflies that are in the caterpillar stage at the time they spray. So they try to target it, but you're still, there's still a risk that we're losing diversity. The introduction of biocontrols, they introduced uh, tachinid flies, which are bristle flies, these big spiky things, a while back, and they in, went out and attacked not just the species they wanted them to, but they went out and attacked the big silk moths. We have a lot less, bi fewer big moths now because of those tachinid flies are in the environment. So when the emerald ash borer exploded, everybody couldn't stop the spread of it, but they wanted to hopefully save some of the baby trees. So they released wasps from Asia and they're releasing millions of wasps from Asia. We don't know what the impact of those non-native wasps is gonna be on the environment. Even though they say they've studied it and it's been vetted, I worry. I have concerns about losing that many. I'm concerned about everybody going out stamping everything because it might be a lantern fly. Um, the thing is with invasives, in most cases, there is a bell curve. And so we freak out when it's up on the top of the bell. But a couple of years later, who's talking about purple loose stripe? It's still out there. Who's talking about zebra mussels? We've got other things. We have moved on to another invasive that we're worried about. The curve, basically they reach that peak, the predators find out that they're there, it's a new novel source of food, they eat it, it comes back down. Um, so sometimes we're just so impatient um, that you know our actions may not have any good anyway. Um, so I hate to say that because everybody wants a solution. There's a lot of money uh, that goes into that. And so obviously when there's a lot of money behind finding a solution, they're gonna find a solution, whether it's a real solution or not. Um, that's one of my concerns. I'm really worried about biocontrols. Anytime you introduce something, you have a risk. This is kind of a really good question. Um, it's one we had before. What are steps we can take to make sure we aren't harming insects unnecessarily? Habitat. Habitat is the biggest thing. Um, there is not a lot of insects in these monocultural cornfields in these lands that have just been scraped in your parking lots, um, the insects need habitat. I mean, yes, we need to protect them from you know, pesticides and other invasives and things like that, but if there's no habitat there, they cannot survive. Um, so everything is based on habitat and leaving, especially the remnants that have these rare plants and these areas, because some of them don't travel very far. I mean, bugs can fly, but by and large, um, bugs don't travel. Some of them do. Some of them travel a long ways. They're actually some of the, uh, uh, I think the large milkweed bug is migratory. That's that's one of them that is. I think there's one other that's migratory. They actually does travel a long distance uh, in the winter, uh, which I find incredible. But there are some out there that just can only move, you know, a couple hundred yards and that's it. That's their whole, or the cactus quarry lives its whole life on cactus. It's not going anywhere. So if we don't protect that habitat, or construct new habitat right next to patches of where they're found, it, it's gonna die out. So that's everything, habitat. All right, um, the next question. Have you read about how the pine beetles in Colorado are killing the forest, but now they're seeing an increase in the biodiversity of plants in those regions? Just right. so this is a real benefit. Yeah, I don't know a whole lot about, I'm obviously focused on Illinois and the Midwest. I mean, I've been out there and I've, I've seen a lot of that dead pines, but I don't know a whole lot about that. Um, but like I said, it's that whole bell curve. I mean, it looks really bad at a certain time, but then they drop off and then other benefits happen. So in a natural condition, you know, we want, same thing with prescribed fires. You have these horror, devastating wildfires that look like they've just ruined everything. But then, I mean, it sounds much like that. It sounds much like the whole impact of the wildfires out West that you're seeing, you know, the regeneration of the plants underneath when you've got increased sunlight. 
anytime you basically do fire, you kill trees, you remove trees, you remove shade, you're going to increase the sunlight, which means more flowers. So pollinators are going to do better. Beetles might do worse. Beetles might require, you know, decaying wood and things like that. There's some species that aren't going to do as good. Pollinators are going to benefit as long as they can survive the impact and survive the fires, you know, in refugia. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Um, the hour's up. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next question is Is there a maximum number of days below freezing that an insect need or insects need in the Midwest? I have no idea. That'd be a good study. <laughs> um, the next question. Climate change seems to be changing plant zones. Are you noticing shifts in bug populations as well? Yes, and I've mentioned that. I will mention, um, I mentioned the red shoulder bug that has basically climbed up. There's also a butterfly called the red banded hair streak um, that again, we, we tend to notice things. I'm north of St. Louis. So I tend to notice things to people. There's more people in St. Louis because it's a big urban area. So there's a lot of photographs. There's a lot, I have friends in the St. Louis area. So they'll notice things in St. Louis that have come up. And then if I find them in my area, because I'm you know a couple hundred miles north of St. Louis, um, then to me, that is a shift northward. Um, so we look for trends like that. Uh, there's another photographer in Wisconsin that finds a lot of things. She's just really obsessed like myself. Uh, and she finds a lot of really rare things that are moving northward. So that having that ability to document, I'm so excited with the cicadas because we don't have really good maps as to where the 13 and 17 year cicadas are because in the most part we haven't had iNaturalist out there mapping them. This year is the first time we're gonna be able to really map those two broods and pinpoint exactly where they are. So next time it comes around in 13 and 17 years ago, from now, you know, we're gonna know exactly where they are going into the ground and where they're going to emerge next. And, and that's really exciting. Knowing these shifts uh, through all this iNaturalist documentation is just absolutely incredible because we are seeing that shift. I just read about the bumblebees not moving north. I just read that uh, last, this last week. Uh, a lot of the researchers are finding that that's one. So that resiliency of whether or not something can adapt to shift its population northward as the climate shifts or whether it can't um, really plays on whether or not it's going to be able to survive all these changes. Some of them will not be able to, and it doesn't really matter in some cases what we do. We may not be able to stem that. Uh, all, how particular one insect is to its host plant, how reliant it is on that one plant, uh, also basically reduces their resiliency. The cactus quarried, if it loses cactus, it's gone, it's dead. There's no other option out there for it. Um, so that one's extremely vulnerable right now. Okay, and our last question is from the Elgin High School um, environmental science class as well. And it's asking, um, would we be able to invite you to our school's nature center to teach us sometime? We would love to walk our nature, our natural area with you. I wish, <laughs> I'm trying. I'm actually gonna go up to uh, Volo Bog uh, up, up north. It's about four or five hour drive. Uh, my husband's originally from Brookfield, so we do come up there occasionally. But for my job, um, because I deal with land protection in Western Illinois, I don't get to travel uh, that much. But I'm really happy to do, you know, these uh, virtual talks and, and things like that. I'm going to be doing a lot more of that in the future. Uh, how much traveling I can do, uh, that's limited. Um, so I, I really want to go visit Volobog. So I'm basically making a deal with the people up there. So I come up, I crash in somebody's uh, living room. And they give me a tour of Volo Bog and I'll give them a talk. So, <laughs> so we're making a deal there. Well, thank you so much for your time. That's the rest of our questions. Right. Um, we really appreciate the entire presentation. We hope yeah. you have a great rest of your day. All right, you too. Thanks a lot. Of course. Bye-bye.